I am going to put a link in the chat bar right now. Here it comes. Okay, let me get back. Great question. The cool, the coolest thing about the report, I, you know, the whole report's cool. But one of the coolest things that we've done this time is we have an, an interactive map that allows uh, folks to click on their um, particular census area. Usually it's a borough, uh, but it also um, goes down to individual communities. And when you click on that, for instance, you know, I'm in the Fairbanks North Star Borough, I can click on there and find out how many nonprofits are in the borough. I can find out what the uh, overall payroll is. I can find out uh, the percentage of the workforce. I can find out um, how much in dollars is contributed through payroll, um, total payroll, but also if we remove government from that. And so some of those statistics are pretty amazing. That's in, you know, uh, I think in the Fairbanks North Star Borough, about 13 or 14 percent of the nonprofit or the workforce uh, is connected with nonprofits. That's pretty in incredible when you think that the national average is about 9 percent. And if you click on Nome or, you know, some of the other communities in the very western region of the state, um, that percentage goes up to 40 or 45 or even 50 percent of the total workforce, much of that related to health care. Great. Thanks for asking that question, Patricia. Patricia. All right. All right, cool. And I think that I have share screen capacity here. Yes, I do. All right, I'm going to put up. PowerPoint. In theory, there it is. And if you've got questions along the way, you know, feel free to jump in, use the chat bar, raise your hand. Okay. So we're going to talk about the board recruitment matrix. Sorry. And this title, you know, is like, okay, well, how could we use the board recruitment matrix for evil, right? And it's not so much that it's used for evil, but we want to make sure we're using it for good purpose. And I think sometimes when we think about a board recruitment matrix and we think about it as just like an inventory of what people bring uh, and what we're missing, it kind of misses the point, okay? So it's much more than that. It really is something that's um, tied to the issue of diversity. It's tied to the issue of um, trying to make sure that we're continually, continually thinking about building the highest, highest performing board that we can, okay? There's a lot of context that sort of underlies this document that we're going to get to as we're um, moving forward today. But the board recruitment matrix is really part of or has a significant connection to the overall concept of nonprofit sustainability. And as many of you likely know, uh, Four Acre has been operating under a, um, our own nonprofit sustainability model for all of our now nearly 22 years. We've had a lot of different ways to present it graphically. You know, when we started out, it was uh, pretty simple, um, just four interlocking circles using a Venn diagram on Microsoft Word. And then one of our uh, board members who had done a lot of reading of uh, Jim Collins's work, said, you know, this really reminds me of Jim Collins and his flywheel, that there's a hub and there are spokes and that it turns a wheel and builds momentum, okay? And, you know, several years ago, one of our board members from Western Alaska said, you know, that really reminds me of an Anuksuk, you know, which is stack of something that you put on the tundra to provide direction, right? We make that. And 
Uh, in the Gaelic language, that's a cairn, right? A C-A-I-R-N. For those of you who are um, hikers, you know that you're uh, when you're on the trail, you're looking for that next cairn to provide direction. And the important factor here is that these are pieces of sustainability that we make. Okay, so if you're on the trail, you might say, okay, we're going to take a left at the Y in the birch tree, or we're going to take a right where the, the river um, um, forks. Those are naturally occurring sort of direction finders, but these are things that we make. And so we talk a lot about how boards really have this ultimate responsibility for building sustainability within their nonprofit organization that there are four big components. I'm not going to go through the whole model today um, or in detail, except to say that, you know, at the bottom of our cairn of sustainability is what we call focus, and that's staying true to core purpose, core values, and identifying a really exciting envisioned future. Where are we going to be in five years, 10 years? Okay. Um, and I'm going to skip that second one where the arrow is and say another factor or component of nonprofit sustainability that we talk about a lot is the importance of partnerships, that partnerships help us leverage what we bring to the table, okay, and that's partnerships with uh, other nonprofits, partnerships with business, government, um, the education sector, the idea that when we come together in partnership, we actually can have greater impact because we're leveraging our resources. That fourth piece there at the top is what we call unrestricted funds or unrestricted cash that um, in the nonprofit sector, um, I guess a phrase in the for-profit sector is cash is king. I and mean, you've probably heard that. <clears throat> but we like to say in the nonprofit sector that unrestricted cash is king. And so those are those dollars that come from earned revenue or um, revenue that's donated, whether through individuals or um, through corporate sponsorships. And certainly as community foundation partners, you know all about those dollars, but it's really maximizing access to those and really to, to avoid being overly dependent on those grant dollars that really are restricted or other restricted funds that come in. But I wanna get back to that second piece of uh, our model of sustainability and we call it the right people. And within right people, there are two main sections. So if we take the right people, we split it in half. One half is staff, okay? Because it's, do we have everything that we need to have the most incredible staff? Because we know that staff are um, responsible for doing much of the implementation work. But the other half of right people is the board, okay? And so um, is the board uh, positioned to be as high performing as it can possibly be? Is it, uh, you know, do, are there job descriptions? Are, are we engaging in strategic recruitment? Are we thinking about the diversity of the board? Um, so within that piece of our model of sustainability is where this idea of an board recruitment matrix lives, right? So if we're really saying to ourselves as a board that, yeah, we wanna make sure that we're enhancing our ability to provide the good governance that helps us meet mission and helps the organization move forward, this is where we might talk about incorporating a board recruitment matrix, okay? So that's, I think, maybe the, the largest order context is that, uh, recruitment matrix lives within sustainability. Um, the board recruitment matrix also lives within what we call the six basic board roles and responsibilities. You know, these are the more um, tactical or um, routine or day to day. I don't know, you know, what kind of descript descriptor is best, but this is the job. Okay, this is the job of the board, right? The legal aspects, making sure that we're planning for the future, um, engaging in the external relations or that being ambassadors for the organization, um, that we're thinking about sustainable income, uh, 
and that we're really meeting our responsibilities around fiscal stewardship. But that arrow points to that third board role and responsibility of human resources. Okay, that's the people part of that job of a board member. Okay, so a little bit more there. You know, for those of you who have been through one of our um, board roles and responsibilities classes or our um, um, board governance series that, you know, we have four sessions over the course of a month. This is one of the things we talk about that the board has a role to play with respect to the human resources in the organization. I'm going to start down at the bottom that, you know, we, we talk about the fact that boards really um, have some boundaries they need to be aware of in terms of micromanaging, right? They have one employee generally, and that's the executive leader. We move up in that human resources responsibility and say that if uh, you do have staff, an executive leader, a CEO, that the board has a, a really critical role to play in ensuring that that partnership between a board and a CEO or executive director is healthy, that, um, you know, it's not just about hiring and firing, right? There's lots of cool stuff that happens in between to ensure that that relationship is strong and healthy and um, you're all kind of moving forward together in pursuit of mission. But that one at the top, this is where the board recruitment matrix lives, that, you know, the board has a role to manage the board. Another way to think about that is maybe um, the board has a role to ensure the care and feeding of the board. And we often talk about the importance of um, having some sort of formal entity within the board, board improvement committee, uh, board development committee, some committee that really has responsibility for um, that care and feeding of the board. And that's where this idea of a board recruitment matrix um, resides, okay? So one of the things we talk about with respect to this um, board recruitment matrix is that it really can be an effective tool in, in not only in ensuring that you've got good diversity on the board, but that you're moving towards this notion of being as high performing as you possibly can. The reality is that the board recruitment matrix, and we'll see this when I um, put it up on the screen as a Word document here shortly, the reality is that it's a piece of paper, right? It's a piece of paper with some stuff on it. Um, we have some ideas about what kind of stuff should live on that piece of paper but it's how we use that document that really speaks volumes about the sort of commitment of the board around this idea of diversity and uh, to pay attention to this concept of being as high performing as you possibly can. So it's not just a piece of, you know, it can be a piece of paper, but again, it's how we use it that's most important. When we talk about the board recruitment matrices that are really most helpful or most useful in organizations, we see that those are the ones that are tied in some meaningful way to the core purpose and core values. Okay, so for instance, at Four Acre, um, you know, our core purpose is to strengthen nonprofits. Our core values are sustainability collaborate, strategic, and sort of an all-encompassing value that we refer to as urban, rural, native, non-native, which really gets to this statewide relevance. And so when we do a board recruitment matrix, we really want to say, it's not just a piece of paper that lives as an inventory of who we have and what they bring, but what are we going to do with respect to the core purpose and core values. What are we gonna do with respect to our envisioned future and maybe some of the strategic priorities that um, guide us? Uh, we know that 
the most useful board recruitment matrices are those that are really connected to um, the board culture, you know, kind of like, okay, uh, I call it the how we roll, but it's, you know, what kind of culture do we live under as a board? Are we a, a board that appreciates lives or lives under consensus? Are we a bo board that um, likes to encourage what we call a climate of healthy dissent? Are we a board that really likes to, to make sure that we're connecting to our communities in a meaningful way? Okay, so that's sort of our, um, another context for the use of these good um, board recruitment matrices. Um, our board values, our individual values. Okay, so again, not just a piece of paper that we fill out because we've downloaded it from the four acre groups website or we've gone on to google and we've found you know uh, any of the 100 different kinds of board recruitment matrices that are out there but that we're using it and it's tied back to some meaningful parts of our operation one of the things that we talk about in another of our classes is it's our high performing boards class is that there's a toolbox you know, that, that high performing boards kind of have a toolbox with about eight good tools that help them to sort of attain or reach toward that high performing category. It could be that we have, uh, you know, um, good planning, could we, that we're, you know, um, doing outcomes measures, kind of seeing how we're doing. Another tool is building a climate of healthy descent. But the seventh tool in this toolbox goes back to that board roles and responsibility around human resources to have a part of the board that really is thinking about the care and feeding of the board as it sort of moves toward that high performing um, concept. To be successful, I just read here, uh, organizations need the staff and board to be balanced, competent, cooperative, and allied around the organization mission. And we use that phrasing to say, all right, let's use this piece of paper to help us do that. Okay, let's use this piece of paper to ensure that we have that balance, that we have that competence, that we are um, cooperative and collaborative with one another moving forward around the mission. Okay. We also talk about board succession being um, the function of a cycle. That, you know, this is something that uh, board development or board improvement committees are um, best um, tasked with, or this is one thing that they consider is that, you know, as we're thinking about board succession, it's not just when people leave. I think maybe that's a, a misnomer is that when we think about board succession, it's like, oh crap, we have to think about board succession because somebody's leaving. It's like, no, board succession is really a, a fairly consistent undertaking that requires, you know, all of these different steps. And, you know, this isn't a high performing boards class, but I want to provide some context that, you know, uh, preparing for uh, recruitment, forecasting, um, once board members come on, nurturing them, providing some orientation, um, placing them um, in the board seat, providing some orientation, ongoing education, um, assessment through things like a board self-assessment. And then when people do leave that, you know, we have the opportunity to think about graceful exit. But that arrow, is pointing kind of between prepare and forecast. So as we're considering this board succession cycle with this goal of you know having the right people on the board at the right time, that this is where a board recruitment matrix can come in really handy as we're thinking about that prepare um, phase of the succession cycle and this forecasting. But I wanna point out under goal there, one of the things to keep in mind 
as you're thinking about this board recruitment matrix is, yeah, our sustainable model, sustainability model says the right people, because we really had two words to put on there. But the phrase really is the right people at the right time. Okay, so the board recruitment matrix is a significant part uh, of that work. And I'm going to stop here after this sort of context setting just for a little bit of discussion. So as we're thinking about this prepare phase and forecasting, which I'm going to describe here in just a minute, it's really good to kind of make sure that we're clear on what a board recruitment matrix is not. Okay, and I've sort of mentioned this already. It's just not a static listing of who we have, what they bring, you know, um, what are their connections, what are their, what's their expertise, and so on, so forth. Again, that's part of it, but we're really doing that work because we want to connect, we want to make sure that we're connected back to the core purpose and core values and this long-term direction with the goal of being this diverse board where we're really encouraging wisdom, right? We're encouraging stewardship. We're encouraging, um, <laughs> a colleague of mine uh, says this, says it this way, we're encouraging disruption, right? And I'm thinking, okay, well, what do you mean by that? We encourage disruption on the board. Um, we know that the boards that really are most effective in their work are those that encourage this, what we call this climate of healthy descent, which is uh, really dependent on people being able to bring up and articulate and uh, in a respectful way, differing points of view. Okay, so, all right, are we all looking for disruptors? I don't know, maybe that's not the right word, but it's that devil's advocate, right? It's that person that questions maybe some of the the norms that we live under or questions the, um, the reasons that we're engaging in um, one activity or another or making certain decisions, right? And in fact, under state law, you know, that's one of the things that board members are supposed to do is practice what's called reasonable inquiry, okay? And, and that's acting, asking questions. A good board recruitment matrix has um, lots of advantages. I mean, there's lots of really cool things that can come out of a good um, process of putting together a board recruitment matrix. It has a tendency to kind of open up our um, view of prospective candidates for the board. Oftentimes when, uh, oftentimes maybe is not the right word, but I've seen it happen that sometimes boards become pretty insular, right? It's a, or what's a good word, homogenous, you know, where it's like, okay, we're, we're a board. And when we go out and look for new people, we end up kind of thinking about the usual prospects. I like to say usual suspects, right? But, you know, they're the people that everybody knows. There's, oh yeah, those people serve on boards or yeah, I was on a board with that person or this person. So um, when we're insular like that, it's pretty difficult for us to kind of break out and, and encourage the kind of diversity that I talked about before that can really lead to that um, higher performing board. So it really opens up our eyes, right? It uh, gives us an opportunity to kind of look beyond um, the folks that maybe we would normally be thinking about um, when we're thinking about board recruitment. Um, sometimes uh, I've referred, I hear them referred to as the superheroes, right? These are the people that are serving on a bunch of boards, two, three, four boards, right? The usual prospects or usual suspects. One advantage. Another advantage is that it does allow us to think a little bit differently about um, the, the right people at the right time. Okay, so if we're if we're not connecting our board recruitment efforts and our board matrix to you know our strategic directions, then we're kind of missing out on being able to connect the kinds of people that we're looking for on a board to the kind of work that we're um, anticipating doing over the course of the next um, uh, several years. 
another advantage is that it and maybe this is the wrong word but i'm just going to say it anyway it kind of depersonalizes the board recruitment process meaning that there's some more um, an institutionalization isn't the right word either formality isn't the right word but it helps us establish a process um, for engaging in the succession planning um, cycle and the different parts of that succession cycle and again ensuring the right people are the right time um, and it's another advantage is that it allows us to say you know we're not just looking for um, superstars you know those people who bring some certain set of qualifications to the board but we're also saying how can they help us do our stuff right so it's not just again this inventory but how can they help us do the stuff that we're identifying as being important over the course of the next five ten years in our strategic plan so there's some good okay so before we start talking about the actual document the board recruitment matrix and kind of going through there i'm catching up on the chat bar here yes differentiation i think that's actually a really great way to to think about it that we're able to um, differentiate those um, uh, folks who we're thinking about as being board members differentiating them in in a way that honors their their commitment what they bring to the table but their ability to help us move forward with mission so i'm going to stop there for a second because i'm sure there's i've been talking at you and i don't like to do that a lot but i wanted to set this context but any thoughts or questions about this um sort of context uh, for a board recruitment matrix has anybody done this before go ahead and jump in be brave Um, I, I guess I would been on a board once where we did the paper piece, yeah. <laughs> not the, um, not the deep thinking piece about um, how to do it. And I guess you, you might get to this later, but my, one of my issues or one of my concerns is how do we identify the people that we, we might want to recruit um, when we, you know, as you said earlier, we kind of go around to the people that we know and who we know of. How do we get to the people we don't know or know of to bring them to to see if we can engage them, I guess? Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit, but it's a great question because, you know, there's a certain amount of comfort, right? And, and you know, go, go and, going to those who we're familiar with. But as we talk about, um, and we've been talking about this so much over the course of the last two or three years, um, about the idea of in, incorporating um, diversity and justice and equity into our organizations, that sometimes there's, there's a discomfort, right, that comes from that because we have to think, who are we not talking to, okay? So one of the things that I've encouraged organizations to do um, over the course of the last couple of years as we're talking about this board recruitment matrix is to be really open and honest and authentic and say, are there voices around this table that we don't have, right? And so are, are we missing um, voices um, around people of color? Okay. Are we missing voices around um, particular stakeholder groups? Are we missing voices um, about, you know, connecting to different parts of our communities? 
are we missing voices talking about things like gender, um, lifestyle? So I think that's a really important first conversation to have is like, who are we missing? Okay. And hopefully, you know, that can lead us to this conversation about, okay, well, how do we access those groups, right? How do we sort of connect with those groups, right? And, and sometimes, and I've seen this happen um, as a result of a board recruitment matrix, is we actually ask people who aren't on the board to help us think about that and think about how we might be able to make those connections. And I think in particular about one board um, where, you know, they were so insular and they recognized and, and, and I'm so, was so proud of them for doing that is that we are completely missing any kind of voice that has to do with um, um, the Alaska native population, right? And so it was like, okay, are there leaders in the community that we can connect with? Not to ask them to be on the board, right? Because that's what they were thinking. It's like, okay, well, we got to connect with these guys to be on the board. But instead to say, you know, part of what we're thinking about as a board is, is, in, is incorporating in a much more authentic way this um, voice. Can you help us think about who we can connect with? And that's, that's a little uncomfortable sometimes, but um, I think it's been really effective and I've sort of provided this advice a couple of times is don't go to the people in, in these, um, in these particular areas of concern or areas of interest, don't go to them and say, hey, we want you to be on the board because you know what? They get asked to be on boards all the time. But instead, what kind of connections do you have that can maybe lead us to folks who might be able to help us in, improve our ability to hear some of these voices? I don't know if that helps or not, Patricia. It helps. And then I have one more question. Maybe I don't want to hog the questioning. Um, but is it also sort of the the opposite that people that we that might help us to do people that we might um, want to recruit don't want to be part of us? <laughs> Does that make sense? That they they're reluctant to join us as well as I mean I'm not saying we're reluctant to get people in, but you know people like to be with people that they know. They do. But, you know, again, this is a conversation that more boards are having, and I've been in, I'm just thinking of two particularly that I've been involved in just over the last couple of months, uh, when one board member said, well, we need to get to an Alaska Native on our board. And then another board member, relatively new board member said, well, why would they want to join? Okay, you know, wh what's been our history? Have we made efforts to connect with this population? Have we had um, successful interactions? Have we shown our um, commitment to this, um, um, this uh, important population in our community? And so I think this is the, what is it? Uh, you know, na navel gazing. Before we go out and ask people, right? We gotta look at ourselves. And I think this is part of the, um, the whole, wonderful conversation about justice, equity, diversity, diversity and inclusion is that the very first part of that is that self-reflection, right? But I think that's a really great question, but we're uncomfortable asking that sometimes, aren't we? Okay. What is it that we're not doing, you know? Um, and, and, you know, it, can we really have an expectation that just because we ask somebody, they're going to say, well, heck yeah, I want to be on that board. But what if, what if they don't like us? I think that's a really important consideration. Margaret? Uh, I'm Margaret from Golden Heart Community Foundation. Um, a couple, we, we're not always good at this, but we're trying. And that is to get, the, get prospective people on committees. And then it's, it's not quite so intimidating as saying, would you be on a board? If they get on the committee, then they can start to learn about our community foundation. They can start to meet some of the people and they, it's a little bit easier transition. 
So as I said, it's happened twice. We've had committee members and then their board members. Um, and we're trying again, but we're not always the best on our committee. So um, it's kind of an exercise in process. That's yeah, it. I mean, this is a, a fantastic um, um, recruitment tool in the future, right? As <clears throat> And actually, Patricia, this goes to your point a little bit too, that, um, you know, is there a way that we can begin to incorporate this perspective or these voices in a way that's short of uh, a board gig? Right. So, I mean, board, being on a board, that's a, that's a big gig, right? It's a, you know, take some time and take some commitment. And, you know, one of the aspects of um, our training and our consulting work around uh, this idea of board recruitment is that making the most of your committees is a really good thing. Not all of us do that very well. Right. But if we are really committed to making the most of our committees, we want to make sure that we're incorporating opportunities for non-board members or community volunteers or others who have an interest uh, maybe in the in the subject area or the organization, but don't necessarily want to be on the board to begin to incorporate those voices. And we often find, and Margaret, you really point this out very well, that you know somebody's on this uh, um, committee and they say, wow, these guys are pretty cool right well, i like the stuff they're, they're doing and and i might even be at the point um after some period of time was like well i actually want to be on the board it's a great recruitment tool but it takes some commitment of the organization right we have to one have this commitment to utilizing our committee structure in a healthy way two um we actually have to have bylaws that allow for that you know it's kind of weird but sometimes bylaws actually say um, here's our standing committees. Um, all committees will be populated by board members. Okay. If we actually say that it prevents us from being able to incorporate some of those volunteer or those, uh, uh, voices from others who may not want to be on the board, but have something important to provide. Um, so we always make a recommendation that either your board, your bylaws should be silent on that, right? Doesn't say who, can be on the board or on the committees, or that it is really specific in saying that we can recruit vo volunteer committee members outside of the board membership. You know. Okay. Other thoughts? It looks like Heather, maybe. Oh, Sorry. Oh, go ahead, Heather, and then Aaron. Mike, I really appreciate um, all of your comments and um, about the board recruitment. And I just wanted to put out there that um, maybe for Patricia's benefit, but um, our board um, uh, has term limits and I know often boards do. And uh, I know as board members reach, start to reach the end of term limits, they almost tend to self recruit and often as like board members or, or like people. And that doesn't allow for diversity because they um, will recruit people like themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not always a good idea. Um, we have a very extensive matrix. This is really good information. Perhaps we can build on our own matrix, but we can really see gaps in our matrix. And based on our our current uh, strategic plan, we can see where we need to fill. And our um, governance committee looks at that each year. And when we go out for um, uh, recruitment, we say, here's, here's where we see our gaps, though all can apply and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll consider all applicants. Here's where we really see our, our, our downfalls in our, um, gaps. Um, but when we, when we kind of self-select and self-recruit, that's, that's really a downfall, I think, mm -hmm. that, and a disadvantage that um, we do to ourselves, or uh, I don't know the proper words, but uh, not always healthy for boards to do. 
Well, it, it certainly, I mean, your observations are fantastic. And I think maybe the way to say it is that it perpetuates the status quo, right? right. And, uh, you know, sometimes boards actually have that as their, their culture, right? That it's, it's, it's an accepted part of your gig on the board that when you're leaving, you have to find somebody, right? That it's, it's an actual, like, yeah, you have to do that. Okay. Can we really force people to do that? No, but when we put that onus on um, an exiting board member, I think you're right, right? It, 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 we don't, and I'm not saying that all board members would do this, but you know, you, you might as a board member go to the path of least resistance, right? It was like, oh my God, finding somebody who doesn't look like me or comes from a different part of the community than me is in a different social strata than me, has different history and background and uh, so on and so, so forth. That's going to be hard. Okay. Well, why don't I ask my friend, you know, who I've known forever, who really wants to be on the board. But so I think the, one of the challenges, and this is that internal navel gazing, right. That we talked about already is to sort of confront that, right. Is that, do we really want to continue to put board recruitment essentially in the hands of an individual, right. Or, is it something that is so important that it really requires not just a, the active board development committee thinking about this and the board recruitment matrix, but really elevating that to the entire board through the process? But that's a great observation. Aaron? I just saw that Heather had a question, so I wanted to make sure she got in there. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. And even after two years, I don't always catch the... Uh, the hands going up so yeah but uh, appreciate that yeah. uh this is cc up in talkeetna um i have a couple of comments one is a question you may uh be able to address later but one is uh just in terms of um, somebody's suggestion, I was actually recruited to the just the community foundation board through involvement in a committee. So Yay. it absolutely can work. And, you know, we have members on our committee who we might consider to be potential board members, whether they do or not, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> yeah. And then we have, um, folks on our committees that are very clear they never want to become a board member but they're really happy to be on the committee that they're on so i think it can work in many you know really um very rich ways for the whole organization um the other topic is our community is not very diverse. So, you know, they're, the biggest diversity is age. So in trying to um, recruit people who come from a different age group, which is usually far younger than me, um, we keep running into problems. So, you know, I'm hoping that at some point you might address how do we recruit some of the younger um, people that we think would be wonderful for the board, but they have, they're too busy with other things or other activities, you know, that are more involving their children or whatever. So, because we, we really run into that issue a lot, you know, yes, I love your, what you do, but I can't be on a board right now. Yeah, no, because of, uh... Well, for, for lots of different reasons, um, you know, we, we can certainly talk a little bit more about this, but, you know, just to open this up to a little conversation to see what other folks think about it, um, you know, there are some pretty significant generational differences that have an impact on our ability to recruit board members, right? That, um, you know, just uh, there's lots of, lots of uh, great literature about you know, the differences between generations. Um, and I've read a couple of them, but, but, you know, one thing is, is pretty clear is one of the big challenges is that millennials and Gen Xers, they don't get tied to organizations like baby boomers that, 
you know, baby boomers are connected to an organization. Like, um, I, you know, I, 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 I've been giving to the food bank for 20 years and I'm going to continue to give to the food bank because uh, I like the food bank. And I'm connected with the organization versus um, say like my 26 year old, right? My 26 year old isn't necessarily going to give to the food bank just because it's a food bank. She's going to look around and she's actually done this. She's looked um, uh, in terms of not only giving, but in board service to, um, to different organizations that are interested in the same kinds of things, right? So um, one of the things we know about um, generations is that uh, millennials, Gen Xers in particular, is that they're more interested in causes and less about or less interested in being connected to organizations. And I think that is certainly one of the, the, the challenges that, that we see, but you've identified some other challenges and, and I'm surprised it's taken this long for it to come up is that we've got a small town, right? We, we've got this little, uh, little group from which to draw, right? And it's like, okay, well, what does diversity look like in Talkeetna, for instance, right? That looks different than Fairbanks. It looks different than Anchorage or Kenai or Palmer or Wasilla. But being able to, again, have that sort of self-reflection to say, you know, what is diversity and, and what does it mean to us? Again, that self-reflection. And I think you, you, you kind of identified one of those things that, that maybe it's about age. Maybe it's about, uh, maybe it's about um, ethnicity. Maybe it's about lifestyle. Every, I think every community has those different kinds of ways to think about diversity. But again, it's that personal reflection, that navel gazing that I think is gonna help with that. But I'm gonna open it up. I'm gonna open it up to folks around the table, uh, around the Zoom room. You know, are there things that you're doing uh, with respect to millennials or Gen Xers that seems to be successful? Well, Especially I'm a millennial. Community. Yay, millennial, yay. <laughs> Um, and I will say for me, the biggest thing is like when the, I first start, I joined the lion's club because my kid's great grandma was part of it. And I wanted them to spend time with her and I love volunteering and I wanted the kids to be able to volunteer and I wanted them to have a respect for their elders. And you're hearing my daughter in the background right now. We're in the middle of potty training. Yeah. Good so, luck. Yeah. Thank you for trying, honey. Come here. <laughs> Anyways, um, but one of the things that I loved about the Lions is they welcomed my kids open armed. So my kids have come to every meeting since they've been born. They know all the Lions. The Lions treat them like grandkids. And they go to all my volunteer things with me. When I was working, my boss let me bring my kids to work. And they went to work with me. They went to all my meetings with me. And I was never... All the organizations that weren't like, oh, you have kids with you. Like they were just like, oh, your kids are here. Wonderful. Yeah. Then I wanted to be a part of that. When they welcomed my kids and they just understood you're a mom and they didn't care that I had a potential screaming kid in the background, then I was more apt to be a part of it. So if my kids can be welcomed, then I'm more apt to be a part of it. But the minute they're like, this is a no kid zone, I'm, I'll am walk away from it because my kids are my most important. So well, and, and not only that, Ashley, but you know. Can you, can you give me the controller and I'll help you? And I, I love to see babies on Zoom. So babies and dogs and cats. So, um, but I think it also is a, 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 that's a good hint for you that maybe this culture, this this board culture is not one that I'll fit in with very well, right? And so, and I think that's part of, and I, maybe this gets back to Patricia's question too about, you know, what if they don't like us very much? What if they don't, you know, appreciate what we're doing? Sometimes that comes down to that board culture, right? Is the board culture welcoming? We're, we've started to use this um, terminology over the course of the last couple of years as we're really on our own diversity, equity, and inclusion journey is, uh, you know, are we a welcoming board? You know, 
when we think about diversity, are we welcoming to folks who have real jobs and aren't just retired? Are we welcoming to voices that we haven't incorporated in the past? Are we welcoming to people that have um, maybe a different economic circumstance? Uh, you know, gosh, just in the course of the last year, I've heard more about um, this idea of the 100% giving board. I mean, it's been part of our, you know, mantra for a long time, right? That there is with a hundred percent giving board. And, you know, sometimes this comes from funders too, that, that there is an expectation that board members will make a gift financial gift to the organization. That's meaningful and significant to each individual board member. But I've heard a bunch of um, sort of pushback on that over the course of the last couple of years. And especially within the last year is that that in and of itself can prevent me from really engaging in, in some sort of uh, board um, act or, or engaging on a board, right? That there is there, and I'm just, this is a question. I'm not saying there is or isn't. I have thoughts on this, but is there a, sort of an implicit bias against diversity in some respects based on that idea of 100% giving board? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is Saunders. Um, a term I heard recently um, was give, get, or get off. Yeah. Right? Um, which is completely uh, connected to cash, right? Cash yeah. money. And um, uh, that idea of you, if you can't give money or you can't get money, you need to get off a board. And it's, uh, it's interesting to me. Um, in some ways, it's really honest. In other ways, it seems really mercenary. Um, and I think what might be wise is to reframe that around, well, what's the giving or the getting part? Yeah. Right? So what are the economies that people are operating in? Do they have a knowledge economy? Do they have a cash economy? Do they have a skill economy? Are they, are they a major connector in their community? That's, that represents a massive sort of invisible economy, but um, it's in, uh, tremendously powerful and valuable um, I think for an organization um, uh, and certainly for a board and trying to move forward, what our goals are. So I really appreciate you bringing that up of that idea of 100% uh, of giving because I think 100% giving can be in different economic forms. It can be cash, it can be knowledge, it can be you know, a bunch of different things, right? So one person may have a lot of cash, but they don't have time or I mean, mm -hmm. basically you hear what I'm saying. So um, I appreciate you saying that. And I also think, you know, the other thing that, that we always sort of proposed was a, an amount that's meaningful to you. So if we have somebody who, and I'm, I'm looking at our um, roster and it looks like we have uh, boomers uh, in the number two category, we have Gen X and we have millennials, right? Yep. So what we're missing um, is Gen Z. So if a Gen Z is a 10 to a 25 year old, you know, and let's say, you know, we're shooting in the 25 year old range, then what's meaningful for a 25 year old as far as cash goes, you know, um, so and I know that money is so important for our endowments and unrestricted funds and uh, all of those things. I know that that is really, really important. And it goes you know, sort of principally, that's how we're showing our sort of power or influence in our communities by getting that money back to our communities. Mm -hmm. um, but thinking about ways to not only sort of identify, but also measure those contributions that people make. So if a 25 year old is uh, given 10 bucks a year, but they're at the table and they're a major connector within their Gen Z circle, then that's a huge contribution not necessarily, not necessarily countable as cash. Yeah. Any more reflection on that? I just want to share that to my my daughter, twenty six. She actually, um, she's stellar, by the way. Um, but she told me one time um, when we were talking about this, she says, "You know, Dad, I I I can't make a big donation to the organization every year." But my network on 
Instagram or my network on social media is momentous, right? That, you know, there's value in that, right? Yeah, it would be nice if we had 10 bucks or 100 bucks to help pay the light bill or make a grant program or, you know, build the endowment, whatever. But the value of some of those other things is pretty incredible, right? And and almost, um, you know, almost, uh, you know, what's the old American Express commercial or the old Visa commercial, right? You know, um, unmeasured, I, I actually can't remember it, but... Uh, Come on, somebody jump in and tell me. Um, it's pri priceless. Priceless. My God, thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> that there are things that have value that are um, different than money. And you you say um, um, give, get, or get off. We often hear the phrase pay to play, right? That, uh, you know, some boards still have that uh, requirement of a certain amount of money, right, to, to be on the board. And and I think most of us would probably not have too much trouble um, agreeing that that's a barrier, right? That that's a barrier to some of those other voices and some of those others who might provide some really insightful um, um, service on a board. Absolutely. I'm checking in on the chat bar. Yeah. Time um, is valuable. See, well, see? again, and I think that's a really important point, you know, and um, we we had a, a board member who was younger and her time and her connections were extremely valuable, but I know that she struggled a lot with what she wasn't able to give. And, you know, um, especially when we started a legacy campaign and, you know, she and her friends could, you know, were really having a hard time connecting to that. So I think it's important that we take a look at all of the different kinds of values that people bring. The other thing that, and I am, um, to, to the person who's, wants to be welcomed with their children that's really hit home that that's that's a really good thing for me to hear um and we have to you know find ways to be open to that because i think that is really important you mm -hmm. know um but another way and not on the board but it's a sort of board committee of the community council that I'm on, um, we invited two young people to be, um, um, they're not full members, they're, well, anyway, they, they can't vote. I mean, we can't no. really officially vote anyway either. I mean, all we can do is recommend to the main body. Um, but I think that training them and, you know, when they're young, if you can, you know, have some kind of involvement with young people, you know, I mean, one is 12 and one is 16, you know, but they've got great ideas. This is a recycling committee, but they've got great ideas and great energy. And, you know, so, but we're basically training them as mm. to the value of service to your community, plus being on a board. Well, it's, it's, I'm glad you bring this up and it's just, so one of the things that I do, and for those of you who've been in sessions with me, you know, <clears throat> that I often like to start out with some really, you know, detailed introduction where, where folks just don't say, you know, I'm Mike, I'm on the board, that's it. But, you know, what brings you to this work? You know, what's, what's your, what's your, uh, what's your genesis story? Why are you sitting around this table? Why is this work important? And, you know, in doing, asking this question now for almost 20 years, invariably, there are people who say, I'm here because my mom worked at a nonprofit and brought me to work, or my dad was uh, on the board and we volunteered all the time. And so to, to sort of build that legacy, I, I see examples of that all the time, you know, that the, you know, that's an important part, but I think Mike, you wanted to jump in, but 
I, I, I want to say that, you know, this isn't a class on, you know, uh, you know, um, 100% giving policy or, you know, those kinds of things, but bring this back to the board recruitment matrix that, that it's not just a piece of paper that you say, oh, we're going to download that from the four acre site and we're going to fill it out. There's a lot of work that has to go in advance of that to say, okay, what are we looking for? You know, what are the kinds of uh, people that we're interested in? What are the sort of organizational goals or envisioned future? And how is that going to translate to what our board recruitment matrix looks like? Okay, so I just felt I had to bring it back. But this is really important conversation because it's part of that prepare, right? Mike, you were going to jump in? Yeah, and, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to sign off here shortly. But what I was... Um, what I was thinking about as, as we had all of these discussions is that this is one tool in a process to improve our organizations because we no one can wave the magic wand and create the perfect board. And especially in an organization that's relatively new, you have to, you have to create a board that can accomplish something. And the more you accomplish, the more successful the organization is. And as the organization becomes more successful, recruiting for the, for the board becomes easier because you're, you're well-known, you're respected, et cetera. So, you know, I think, I think the, the, the key here is that when we have the opportunity to um, add to our boards, that we find someone who can fill one of these, um, one of these holes in our in our skill matrix or our, our cultural matrix. And it's always going to be something that we drive forward on um, and, and to really think of it as a longer term process. And, and I think that this is one of the tools that we need to keep in mind as we move forward. And I guess with that, I will thank you, Mike, for the for the discussion, but I have other things on my calendar and uh, uh, Appreciate all the participation from, from everyone from PCF and, and around the state and other organizations. So thank you. Well, uh, well, if you can hang on for like 20 seconds, Mike, I want to just respond to what you said about, you know, the right people. You were really saying the right people at the right time. If we really I can think about our organizations being in a life cycle, you know, whether we're a startup or we're trying to build stability or we're trying to become more resilient or, you know, trying to be more generative or innovative that there's not a static board member that fits in all of those parts of the life cycle. So this is an incredibly important conversation is like, where are we? Are we a startup? If so, we're looking for workers, right? We're looking for worker bees. Whereas if we're in, we've built stability, we're building financial resilience, that we're looking for uh, folks who can maybe concentrate more on governance. But this is a great point, Mike, and I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Cool. All right, let's see if we can start figuring out how to use this thing. Okay, because we've, again, we've done some preparation, some internal navel gazing, so that we can then move in to start filling out this form which we will utilize in um, a good way and not use it for evil, meaning not use it, okay? So if we create this board recruitment matrix, and I'm gonna put up our template here in just a second to show you what I'm, I'm talking about, but we do wanna make sure that we're connecting this back to our, our core purpose and core values, who we are as an organization. We wanna connect it back to our um, envision future. Where do we want to be in five years? Okay. What are the particular um, sorts of goals or priorities that are driving us? I've got an example there that I'll walk through just about, you know, increasing charitable giving, but maybe it's about increasing diversity within the organization. Maybe it's about um, starting new programs in areas where we haven't been before. Maybe it's reaching out to other parts of the community um, that we haven't touched before. So being able to say, all right, we've got this plan that identifies the stuff that's of interest to us to work on. 
that needs to be incorporated into that uh, board recruitment matrix. But other tools that we have, the, the job descriptions that we develop as board members, we want those to reflect this um, sort of internal navel gazing and this idea um, about not just what you bring, but what you can do to the organization, okay? So as we're thinking about sort of the main components of a matrix, um, I kind of identify them there, but you'll see it on our, um, when I put up the word document, their background, skills and talents, characteristics, work styles, um, access to constituencies, maybe um, uh, being able to um, articulate voices that we haven't had or we haven't been able to incorporate before. We want to be as specific as we possibly can in this matrix. So this is the example that that I have. All right, say, you know, say one of the parts of our envisioned future is that we want to in, increase the percentage of individual charitable giving as part of our overall revenue stream to, I don't know, 20 percent. Maybe it's five now. We want to increase it to 20 percent. Woo! That's a big jump. Right. And I know it's different for you guys as community foundations because you're all about that individual charitable giving. Right. But maybe it is about increasing the size of the principal. Right. So what kind of people are going to be helpful in that process? Right. Do we need somebody who can access a different set of stakeholders than we've been able to um, access before? Do we need people who have experience with raising dollars? Um, do we look for people who have particular corporate contacts? Do we look for people who um, may not be good askers, but might be good, um, uh, might, might be able to play a role in, in our fundraising in another area, or maybe somebody who's really visionary that we wouldn't necessarily expect to be part of that detail part. So we want to be as when we're putting these together, we want to be pretty specific. Okay? But again, specificity to what? Strategic plan, core purpose, core values, uh, envision future, uh, and really the products of this internal navel gazing. That's not an official term, but you can certainly use that if you want. Okay? So this is just a slide that I uh, put up before I go to the Word document, but you know, it is a document. Starts out as a document that is blank, right? And, and so uh, in that document, just conceptually speaking, we're gonna identify who we have as current board members, right? We're gonna identify potential, if we have them, potential prospects that might be able to fill some of those gaps, okay? But you see up there characteristics, okay? This is where we start to say, all right, this is what we have and, and this is what we need. And this is where we start just putting X's, okay? We start filling this in, right? But again, it's not just the document that we fill in. There's a lot of work that goes in uh, advance of that. So in theory, well, I thought that I might be able to put this document that I have in the chat bar, but does any, even after two years, I'm there's still parts of Zoom that I'm not familiar with, but if I have a Word document, um, other than just to share it, is there any way that you guys can actually get it? Anybody have any insight? I think I have the link to download the document. I could put that in the chat. Oh, sweet, that would be awesome. Okay, so are you looking at a board recruitment matrix right now? Are you, okay, cool, yay. All right, and thanks uh, for doing that, Aaron, awesome. I can also go on the chat bar, hold on, I'm learning upload a file from my computer. Look at that. Hold on a second.
Oops. Gotta get to the right place. Where's it now? It says there's an error because it's currently in use. Well, darn it. All right, I'm going to stop using it there. I think I got it in there, Mike. Okay, cool. All right. I know if you guys can't access that. Yes. But, you know, this is for you guys to, if you want to start filling this out now, great. But, you know, this is more, uh, you know, these are the kinds of considerations that are going to help us um, produce a, a board recruitment matrix that's helpful. Okay. And you're certainly welcome to use this form. You'll find it's funny. You'll find, um, like I said, there's hundreds of different examples on Google about board recruitment matrix. Some of them are already filled in for you. Some of them have lots of categories that are probably of little value to you, especially as we're, uh, you know, in Alaska, we like to be chronically unique, right? That there are challenges that we face in our communities that aren't necessarily addressed by, a, uh, you know, a fill in the blank board recruitment matrix from some consultant in Washington, DC. So we on purpose really um, leave this blank because it's all about the stuff that's important to you. Uh, Saunders, you have some filled out examples from some of our peer affiliate community foundations. If that question is for me, no, but I'll put it out uh, to the group. Has anybody done this? Maybe can share. I think, I, th I hope that's what you're asking, Saunders. Ah, Debbie, yes. All right, cool. There I am. This is Debbie in Palmer. Hey, Debbie, thanks for sharing, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, I'm not at the computer that I have it stored on. Um, I'm also not at a computer with camera, but <clears throat> um, we have one, I believe the Palmer Community Foundation, I believe I brought us one, but I don't know if we really fleshed it out and have used it, but we had one at um, Alaska Family Services that, mm was that that very one we got it from four acre group um seems one other board but yeah i have i have a couple of them but they're that format since we got it a long time ago from cool. four acre and i will um i'll definitely get it to saunders palmer community foundation people we 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 started out with um in both organizations that used it you know here everybody fill in your line right yeah what do you think you and and then um and then we just had discussions around what where we were strong where we were weak and then we we added some things some categories Good. that were just specific to our community we felt we needed it, you know we really really wanted someone from the school district and someone from law enforcement so we like added a whole line just for them well, that's excellent. And that's really why we put it out this way rather than populate it or pre-populate it with stuff is that we're all different. And, you know, like I said, we like to be chronically unique, but in some respects we are, right? Each of us, um, e even with affiliate community foundations, you have different sort of um, community cultures, right? You have different um pieces of your community that are going to be important so i'm so glad that you said that debbie because that's again that's why we have this as a less of a fill in the blank um template but one that you need to make your own yeah so this is kate hi kate yeah can i add a comment golden heart um so we have several board matrices that we've used in the past i think one of the challenges some of the um matrices that are here that have been filled out in the past or or some of the perspective ones i have an awful lot of attributes things like collaborative so these would be for perspective 
um, respectful of varying points of view, leadership potential, optimistic, team player, et cetera. You know, those attributes are really, you're not going to know that in advance. So I don't, I, I, I think uh, in, in thinking of a matrix uh, and, and the, that the, what the community foundations need is they need the diversity in um, uh, uh, age diversity um, and the ability for potential board members to uh, hit other sectors that are un underutilized or under tapped into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually have a name for those people. We call them boundary spanners, right? Because right. they're able to sort of move beyond one sort of silo group or network to make connections to other, um, other constituencies, other stakeholders, other parts of the community. But yeah. So this is a great observation, though, Kate, is that, um, you know, those are kind of amorphous. Right. And it was like, well, maybe th those are really things we want of all board members. Right. So it's it's that could live. And I'm glad you brought this up. You know, those kinds of things could live in a job description uh, for board members. Right? Be collaborative, be, you know, um, uh, respectful of others, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that could and I bet some of that might even connect back to core values of the organization. But I think this is a great point that we really find out that kind of stuff when we sort of utilize the results of this matrix to enter into what we, you know, it's like courtship, right? That we identify these folks and then we may have some process of uh, vetting, you know, lack of a better word, vetting, uh, you know, uh, meeting with the, the uh, board development committee to get a sense of not only the skills and expertise and all that stuff, but how they are as people, right? That the, do they, are they people that can um, really align themselves in some meaningful way with what we value in the organization? But this is a great point. We probably don't want to spend our time with that criteria that we might want to see in everybody. Does that make sense, Kate? And if Kate jumps back in, great. Heather, you have your hand up. Yeah, if there's a way um, to uh, share my screen, I'm happy to share a screenshot of our... Um, Do it. Uh, Sorry, our matrix. Okay, Erin, can you make sure she's got that? I'm gonna stop sharing mine. And it, I just threw it into a Word document. Cool. Uh, let's see. See if I can get the right screen sharing here. It's very extensive. Um, <clears throat> did I share, can you see a Word document with a bunch of? Yeah. Okay. so. If you see here, board member, we have term limits. So I um, put when they're elected and their term term dates here, we have gender, age, and race. Mm -hmm. um, and then where they fall and they fill this in um, and they rank their experience level here. So this is at, at, um, at risk youth. Um, sorry, they kind of, some of them cut out because we had to make them so small. Mm -hmm. um, but we kind of put different places of priority in our work. And then it continues on. I cut it to fit here. Um, other experience that they think is relevant and, and then some of their, um, obviously recreation volunteer stuff here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is our joint venture piece of our work that we do. And the borough is very large. They have to be a part of the borough to be on our, serve on our board. So um, broken out in region, we want to represent um, all the various regions. So we track that. 
Um, so we have representation from all areas. And then access to um, policymakers, um, disability representation and veteran representation, and then other important um, qualities that they think are relevant to their service on our board. Um, I send this to every board member to fill out. Um, and we update this annually. Good, good, good. Every June. Um, and then every board member does that. I update it in the main, the, on my main chart. And, um, and then every year we analyze this to see where our gaps are and to see where we need to recruit. So this is how we chart okay. um, our needs. <laughs> and this is how extensive our matrix current matrix currently is. And we're always adjusting this and reevaluating this. So um, first, thank you. This is incredible. This is really a good example of making this your own. Um, I really like, and you know, you guys are um, health foundation, so this is important to you. The you know those different areas, the different aspects of of health. That's not just healthcare, right? Um, but being able to say, all right, who are we missing there? But the annual part. Um, this is one of the recommendations I sort of made already, and I will before we're done, but that's part of the institutionalizing this part. You know, it's not like, oh, crap, somebody's leaving. We have to do a recruitment matrix. This is more a sort of a standard part of our um, governance um, gig, right? And how that depersonalizes it. It sort of gives you a, a rolling view on where where we need to go. And so I really like that. That's a really great way to think about that. Are there things that are that you have talked about that might be missing from that matrix, Heather? Um, yeah, we've talked about the um, different uh, gender. Um, not just the, you know, the female, male genders. Um, and, and we could make this huge by broadening um, ethnicity and by broadening gender and by broadening all of those, mm -hmm. um, I guess, if you will, others. But um, it, it, that, because we know um, we lack those, we in the chart we talk about those regularly, and we're um, we're we're really on a path in our DEI work in general, um, and so it's been a really big topic of discussion, um, kind of to take us a little off course, just in general. Yeah. Um, in our work, uh, in that course, so we we see that lacking in our matrix. Okay. Working on that, um, uh, disability was a huge miss, and that was identified a few years ago. Um, and part of that was um, in hiring uh, in a disability, a man mm -hmm. with a disability. And he's opened our eyes hugely to that world, um, which was fantastic. And not that, um, yeah, it was just, it, it was huge. Um, so well, I don't want to put you so much on the spot, but you know, just some of those things where it's like, it really speaks to this idea that this is a dynamic thing, right? This isn't a, hey, you know, we built this uh, 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 board recruitment matrix in, you know, 2005, and we're still using it with the same kind of categories, but this is a dynamic document. And if mm -hmm. we're more attuned to that, and, and even if it's annually is great, at the very least, 
reflecting like the terms on the board, whether it's every three years or every two years or, or whatever, but being able to say that, you know, just because we have this document from 10 years ago that has these categories that are important, are they still important? Right? No, it is ever evolving. Yeah. yeah. Ever. I mean, like we're taking things out, adding different columns in, and it's all based on our, truly it's all based on our strategic plan. I'm not worthy. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. But that's the, that's the, that's the way to make the most of this document is that it becomes more institutionalized, right? It is regularly updated, not just in a crisis. It is tied to the strategic plan, right? And, and it does form a real, and it comes from internal navel gazing, mm -hmm. right? but it does actually become a useful document. And um, Aaron, you have your hand up, but I've got a Patricia question in the ch chat bar. Okay. Oh, somebody's answering. Tool for the nominating. Yes. I mean, that's what I was going to say that when we have members, um, when we're in a membership organization, members do different things based on the bylaws, articles of incorporation, so on and so forth. Um, sometimes we have members who are deeply involved in governance around bylaws. They can be involved in uh, electing board members, they can be even involved in electing officers. So you know, I think there is some flexibility here, but Ashley's point is spot on, is that the only place that, um, and I say that maybe with not so in such a finite way, the only place, but the primary place where as an existing board, we can have and perhaps influence isn't the right word, but an impact on who comes on to the board is through that nominating process and really making that part of a, uh, even incorporated into the bylaw. So it's a standard that, you know, we are vetting all of the people that are coming forward to potentially be board members. Um, and we can't guarantee it. You know, that's one of the challenges with a membership organization is that sometimes wrenches get thrown into the works and you know you do a lot of work as a nominating committee to have a slate and all of a sudden somebody who's mad about something brings a constituency and poof they're on the board but there are things that we can do and i think ashley you've hit it on the head and i hope pat it answers that question that there are some things that we can do to uh, sort of impact through this recruitment matrix who gets nominated and who is put forward uh, in a, in a, either as a slate or as individuals for a board election. Okay. Aaron. A discussion really helped answer some of my question too. And the other part might be sort of obvious to everyone else, but I'm curious if the categories from the board matrix are incorporated in like the application process as well or is that just something you get a feel for when you're interviewing the folks or even before you reach out to people to ask them to be a board member well i'll ask heather to jump in on that sort of implementation part but there are a couple of places where this can be really valuable um uh i guess maybe the main place is in your job description Right, so there are potentially general statements that reflect back to some of those specifics. We don't want to necessarily clutter a job description with all of the specifics that Heather has in there, but there are some things in there about, you know, um, having a, a, a broad connection to health or um, representing certain parts of the borough or um, certain voices, we could probably incorporate some of that. But I think another place where we can incorporate that is in our, not everybody does an application, but some people do, right? You have an application. We can incorporate some, um, what I call values-based questions that are less about, you know, do you know how to do a budget? Yes. You know, do you do fundraising? Yes you know, like sort of yes or no things, but incorporating some of um, more values-based questions that 
essentially, you know, maybe this isn't the right word, but force a potential board member to in 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 a narrative space to kind of give you a sense of who that person is and how they can help meet some of those things that are, are that have come out as important as a recruitment matrix, you know, that vetting. <laughs> I get this all the time. Is Mike, we have a hard enough time getting board members. Why would I put them through that process? Right? Well, because, you know, if you are employing what I call the pulse method of board recruitment, which is, this is the biggest indication. It's like, I'm going to take your pulse. It's like, yeah, you've got one. Yeah, you can serve on the board. You kind of get what you ask for, right? You're, you're kind of getting that person that, you know, may be really committed. That would be great but it really brings so many challenges if we can be more strategic in our process of recruitment, um, whether it's vetting, courtship, um, being able to uh, move away from that, you're exiting the board, you have to find your replacement, whatever those sort of in results of that internal navel gazing are, the better that we can incorporate that um, to the good of the high performing board, even in smaller communities, right? So, uh, Heather, were you going to jump in since I asked you that question? I sure can. Um, what we do is we um, we make several announcements in several places when we um, do do when we when we start our recruitment process, um, and we launch on our website an expression of interest. So it's kind of a pre-application process, and we um, that's. The, that's where we ask some of the questions kind of specific to mm -hmm. where they live and what their interests are. And we're kind of strategic in how we ask them to answer some of these questions um, without just outright asking them some of these questions um, to identify and fill out some of the matrix holes that we, we want to identify. Um, and then we, and, and then, and get to the, the needs and root mm -hmm. of why we want them serving on the board and why they are interested in serving on the board and the needs of our community, right? Um, and then we, the governance, our governance committee reviews them all. Um, we select a smaller group, and with, then we go through an interview process, a formal application process, excuse yeah. me, and then an interview process. Um, and so it's a it's a way to vet out more. That expression of interest is a more detailed process than our formal application process, honestly. Um, uh, and so that's where yeah. we get well, and you're really getting at more of what kind of person they are, right? Right, versus what skill set do they bring? Right. I think that's really so important. Now, um, that process is pretty detailed, a lot of steps. And I think it's also important to recognize that you know, in our smaller communities, I'm just thinking, you know, CC and um, Talkeetna you know, she may not have that really in-depth process, but I think incorporating the spirit of that process is what's important, right? That, uh, you know, we might do that in different ways. We might just have one meeting, okay? We might not do an application. We might not ask for um, some narrative responses, but really being able to incorporate, again, the spirit of that vetting, I think is really important, right? Our process as a whole takes, you know, anywhere from four to six months sometimes, yeah. depending on how many we're looking for and um, the needs that we have. Yeah, and it, it, it really says that this is, and I, you know, I'm a little irreverent sometimes that this is not an, oh crap, we got to do a board recruitment matrix. It's like this really is a, a fairly standard part of how we um, prepare and recruit 
um, the board members that will help us be as high performing as we possibly can. So I really appreciate, really appreciate that. Checking in on the chat bar. Patricia, is the board in charge or does staff help with the process? I'm gonna, before Heather jumps in, I'm gonna say, you know, it's, it's the board's job, right? It's the board's job to recruit the board um, or to cause the, I guess, the process of nomination in those membership organizations. That doesn't mean that in larger organizations with greater staff capacity, that there isn't a role for staff to play, but they're not the drivers, right? They're the helpers. And I, that's probably what you were gonna say, Heather, right? Yeah, I would say it's, it's largely um, staff run, I would say, but it's um, board decision led. Yeah. yeah, and I think that just, you know, that as we, if we're smaller, as a as an organization as a board we're doing more of that stuff but as we get bigger and more complex we do start to incorporate staff to help with some of the more sort of routine pieces of this process and that's totally normal mm -hmm. okay all right we just uh, got a couple of more minutes and i want to walk through this my job today wasn't to say, oh, by one o'clock, boom, you have a recruitment matrix, but just to introduce the concept and really be able to talk about um, um, the context and what other people are doing, but some things to consider, okay? As um, we're looking at that um, sample on the page above, just wanna go back there really quick so people remember, okay, here, in these up and down things, right? These vertical things, this is where we might consider um, skills and talents, okay? We might talk about expertise. We might talk about, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a good uh, fundraiser. I'm a good connector, whatever, okay? And then some of those verticals might, have to do with who am I connected with? And um, Heather, if you could share that one with everybody, that would be awesome, okay? Um, names redacted, so we don't have, you know, don't have to worry about confidentiality, but if that's a possibility, that would be cool because it was really great. But one of you said, one of the things you highlighted was access to policymakers, okay? So that might be one of uh, your verticals, access to policymakers. I've seen access to local, state, and federal policymakers, where some have um, parsed that out a little bit because part of their core purpose and envisioned future has a significant policy component, and perhaps even at a particular level of government. Um, constituencies, faith, civic groups, um, ethnic communities, um, you know, um, lifestyle. Uh, communities, nonprofit ally, whatever. So those are some of the verticals that you might consider. Um, you might consider verticals that have to do with background, okay? These are just some examples, age. You know, I know that that was something that CC talked about, gender, um, ethnicity, geography. Um, this is funny, these are all reflected pretty much on, um, the example that Heather shared, um, communication background, whatever. And then we start to talk about the, the uh, potential characteristics or style. I did say that some of this could live in a job description, but I think some of this can, if they're verticals, they can help guide us in sort of the recruitment process or the sort of investigation or vetting, okay? But again, these are all about you. There is no standard, you have to have these things on your verticals in that board recruitment matrix because we're all just a little bit different. Uh, we're in different communities. We um, are interested in different constituencies, different um, uh, parts of our communities. So, you really wanna be able to tailor this and I'm scrolling down and I wanna end with a couple of 
observations about using the matrix. Okay, so we're gonna make, make those verticals. Okay. We're gonna have our um, existing board members in, in that first part of the column. And what I've, I've seen it done a couple of different ways. Either it's the self-report, okay? Because ideally the board has been involved in some way in sort of developing this matrix, whether just on approval or coming out of a, a board development committee. Uh, another thing Heather said that was important is this might be a governance committee, different names, okay? So have your board members, existing board members fill that out. Then as the board development committee, we're gonna say, all right, we're gonna share that so we can identify some of the gaps. Okay. Just technically speaking, if you've got an empty box, okay. That could represent the sort of people or person that we're seeking. It's funny, you know, I've heard this reference a bunch over the years. It was like, we're trying to find a person who has all of these qualities, right? They got, they're, they're this, 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 and this, boom, you could be a board member because you hit all of our gaps, right? Uh, usually said in jest, but you're not gonna find one person likely who can fill all that, okay? This is likely uh, a number of potential board members who can help address some of those gaps. And then we start to identify potential names. Okay. Hopefully, you know, this gets to the point about, all right, well, what if we don't have connections to that community, right? Well, maybe we have an interim step that rather than identifying people who can sit on the board, maybe identifying those who can help us identify who might be interested in um, a board commitment. And then we start the recruitment process. This number eight, remember this is a dynamic document, okay? I mean, so many times I, I heard, I've heard over the years, well, yeah, we gotta do this now. We can't find that old one. So we have to start over, which is okay. But I think if we're really incorporating this as a more sort of institutional part of our uh, board governance, it just becomes normal. Okay? It just becomes a normal part of uh, what we're doing. Okay, we are like five minutes away and I wanna make sure that we have time for thoughts and observations or next steps. But um, I'll put it out to you guys. Any, any aha, you know, any ahas or yeah, we need to start doing that, or we're already doing this, or maybe there's one thing that we can do differently, and okay? one thing that we can add into our recruitment that might help us um, utilize this board recruitment matrix for good and not for evil. So I was hoping we could turn this into a two-part, and in the next part, you tell us where we find all of the people. Oh yeah, that's the easy part, <laughs> right? Yeah. No problem. Yeah. yeah th this is Kate um, from Golden Heart. I can't figure out how to raise my hand on the screen. But anyway, um, so I <clears throat> was wondering if anyone had ideas on how to reach out. Our, our board uh, is um, fairly um, mature. Uh, and um, <laughs> A lot of a lot of people are laughing if you can't see them. Right. Well, right. Yeah. right. So um, uh, how to reach out to uh, the, the younger community? Um, uh, you know, we have a semi diverse, but not age wise. Uh, and I just was wondering how we go about uh, trying to find some younger people. Um, and get them interested. I mean, it, even just uh, reaching out to different populations in, in a variety of ways. And it's a hard one because like we were saying before, all of the, the, you know, the, the younger people tend to be very busy with their families, um, hockey, 
soccer, dance, all of that stuff. And it's very challenging. And I did appreciate the comment from Ashley about being inclusive to children. And, and I get that part of it. It's just a matter of how do you find somebody that you can tell them that, you know, more inclusive to children, but you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I appreciated Ashley's story. Uh, that was because Ashley was out there seeking instead of having someone seek out her. So that's, anyone got ideas? Hey, Kate, this is Margaret. Um, I'm from Golden Heart. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a think tank. We invited some of our major donors, oh, eight or nine of them to a backyard party and just ask them why they donated to the community foundation, what ideas and so forth. And it was really a big success. Maybe we could do a think tank with some of our younger donors and ask them some of the same questions. What appeals to you? What would you like to see? What causes? And just kind of start to engage them on, on a just kind of a communication level and from that, we might find a committee that they would fit and start um, pulling them in that way. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So Kate, I will say for the Power Community Foundation, I'm, I'm not technically on their board yet, <laughs> but what? what happened, I know, um, it's something that's supposed to be voted on, but um, they still invited me to join in on the training right now, but, actually I wasn't the one who was approached about it at first it was my husband who was approached um, Mike had reached out to my husband because he had work dealings with him and my husband goes you know what um he was being approached at that time by another organization and he goes you know my wife is actually in the Palmer community she's a big part of it she does lions she's really invested in what's going on and what's happening around our kids lives there and he goes I think maybe you should talk to her instead and so maybe even if you have somebody in mind that you approach if they say you know I don't have the time there's a high likelihood they might know somebody who's in their age group that is invested in something going on in that community and I have a lot of mom friends because I'm part of a mom group who are like, well, we really want our kids to volunteer. And I told them, I'm like, go find a local Lions Club. Like, figure out where your local Lions Club is and see what they're doing volunteer-wise because they know, like, for me, we're in the schools doing vision screening. And I loved it. And mm -hmm. I told them the reason I loved it is I got to tour all the schools <laughs> before my son went into kindergarten and meet the teachers and the staff and see what the kids were experiencing there. And so I could give them, while these are important to us as moms, if you're active in this, this is how it'll benefit you as well. You'll get to find out more about the community. And I joked with them, I said, you know, the great thing about Lions is they're a 70 plus group pretty much. And they're all retired. And I have eyes all over the community so that when my kids become teenagers, and uh -oh. try to sneak off somewhere, <laughs> I will be contacted. <laughs> so I, finding ways to see the benefits in it, to get them involved. And I know the other big thing for my age group, it is time. And when Mike and I met for lunch, I said, what's the time commitment? And he said, our board meetings once a month. I'm like, I can handle once a month. And I can, outside of that, we're given tasks, but I can accomplish those tasks while I have my kids around. And so it's how much of this is going into it and how, how much is my time gonna be required? Am I pulling away from my family? Am I pulling away from work? Or can it be a part of that as well? And that's why I was like, yeah, you know, I wanna be a part of what's going on in my community, what's going on in Palmer and helping around there. So just from my point, but if you know somebody that you're like, I really want them, and they can't, and but they're that group that you want, you can ask them, is there somebody you know who you think would be good for this? Um, I'm gonna 
catching up uh, on this chat bar thing, but while we're doing that, Jim, you raise your hand. Yeah, I, I, I did. And, you know, and I've uh, had this discussion with our board um, before is, you know, the question comes up is how do we recruit new people? I think, you know, for me, it, it's more of an advertising, if you want to call it, or marketing ploy because there's so many people out there that do not even know that these community foundations exist. You know, it's only the folks that, you know, are kind of actively involved, but, you know, and I've, like I said, I've talked about this before our board and, and that's always been a concern with me. I, I only found out about it because I happened to be walking by what Palmer has a garden fair and I happened to see a couple of my friends sitting at a booth and I went over and talked to them and they were lo and behold, part of the Palmer community foundation mm -hmm. board. And, and, you know, um, unless we're out there kind of letting people know that we're what we do and who we are and you know what our goals and objectives and vision is uh we're going to only get the same folks that we get currently um so i'm not sure exactly how to go up about you know getting our name out there if you will yeah, i mean yeah this is a i mean so important to to think all right we're doing good work let's keep doing good work but then we feel, what is the word, hubris, right? It was like, gosh, we don't really want to go out and talk about ourselves too much. It was like, well, if you're not going to do that, who's, who's, who else is going to? The answer is we don't know. But being able to toot your own horn is, is a great way to attract interest. There's nothing that breeds um, interest in board service better than success, right? And sometimes it's, how have we been successful? But I think that's an important part of this conversation. A friend of mine, uh, just about six months ago, we were having this conversation and I asked him the same thing. How are you reaching millennials and, and Gen Xers and, and Ys and et cetera? He says, well, I go to their parents because those are the people I know. And so she said that that was an incredibly effective mechanism. It's like, okay, well, who do you know who's in that other age group. And she has found that to be incredibly effective. It was like, wow, oh, what a great idea, okay? Use those people that you know to be able to reach into some of those other, um, other constituencies. I, I just wanna point out Martha, um, who's left, um, had a great point is oh, yeah. using social media. Yep. Because that's where, you know, younger people, so, you know, um, I mean, you know, as a, a, a mature person, I tend to not use the same social media as younger people do, but, you know, we need to become savvy to do that, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, go where people are and get the messages across. And thankfully, um, we do have a good person who, um, on our board, that's her thing. She does the social media. So I, I think that's really an important point. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's actually okay to pay somebody else to do that. It's a, it can be a real valuable, um, a valuable investment. Just as we're getting off here, um, I am happy to, to, if there's a second thing to talk about progress or see what folks are doing, happy to do that. Um, but think about think about this you know look internally what is it before we start doing this matrix and start reaching out to people are we doing things that are pre preventing certain folks from becoming interested and engaging right are there things that we're doing that are presenting challenges so do some of that internal navel gazing before you start jumping into this uh, board recruitment matrix. Trust me, it'll be, actually, it'll make it way more robust and ultimately more useful, okay? Because again, not just a piece of paper, okay? It's a piece of paper that we do something with. Mike, is it cool. possible to get the slides that you were yeah. showing today? Yep. It'd be awesome. I'd be happy to email that out to everyone. A yeah, lot I, I, I'm happy to do that. that. Happy to do that. Like I said, I was actually sitting on the couch until like 15 minutes before. I was like, I'm going to put together some slides. Haven't done a training on this before, but yeah, happy to do that. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you. And uh, for people in the, the Golden Heart, boy, we've got some nice sunshine. It's supposed to warm up, right? Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you so everyone. much for your time, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Glad to do it. I appreciate the uh, appreciate the participation. You guys are awesome. Thank you, and thank you, Palmer, for doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Have a great day, everybody. All right. Cool. Everyone. Bye.